Hi, welcome. Um, good afternoon, everyone on the East Coast, and good morning to everyone else. Thank you so much for your patience this morning and for joining us. Uh, I am so incredibly excited to welcome Jean Bliss for, to our webinar today. Uh, I'll give you a little bit about a background of Jean Bliss if you don't know who she is. Jean Bliss is the founder and president of Customer Bliss and the co-founder of the Customer Experience Professionals Association, CXPA. She is one of the foremost experts on customer-centric leadership and the role of the customer or the chief customer officer. A consultant and thought leader, Jean Bliss guides C-suite and chief customer officer clients around the world toward earning the right to business growth and prosperity by improving customers' lives. Jean Bliss actually pioneered the role of chief customer officer, holding the first ever CCO role at Land's End, Microsoft, Coldwell Banker, and Allstate Corporations. Reporting to each company CEO, she moved the customer to the strategic agenda, redirecting priorities to create transformational changes to each brand's customer experience. She has driven achievement of 95% loyalty rates, improving customer experiences across 50,000 person organizations, which I think all of us can agree that's, that's pretty big. Uh, her ability to effectively guide leaders and companies to earn customer driven growth is based on these experiences as a practitioner for over 20 years, working across organizations to unite the C-suite and organizational silos. So Jean is the author of the groundbreaking book, Chief Customer Officer. The book was the first of its kind to address the role of the customer leadership executive. It quickly became a bestseller and has been translated now into eight languages. Her second book, I Love You More Than My Dog, Five Decisions That Drive Extreme Customer Loyalty in Good Times and Bad, was also a bestseller translated into five languages. She adds to that list, Chief Customer Officer 2.0, and her latest book, the one we're gonna speak about today, Would You Do That to Your Mother? The Make Mom Proud Standard for How to Treat Your Customers, released just in May of this year. In this book, Jean urges companies to make business personal and to earn ardent fans and admirers by focusing on one deceptively simple question, would you do that to your mother? Make mom proud companies give customers the treatment they desire and employees the ability to deliver it. They turn gotcha moments into we've got your back moments by rethinking business practices and they enable employees to be part of the solution to fix customer frustrations. Bliss scoured the marketplace seeking companies who <laughs> Sell at living, you'll have to talk about that a little bit because you did, I know you did. Scoured the marketplace seeking uh, companies who excel at living their core values grounded in what we all learned as kids. She offers a five-step plan for evaluating your current behaviors and implementing actions at every level of the organization. So um, I'm very excited about this today. Um, Jean and I are just gonna kind of throw some questions back and forth, talk about some of the content in her book, how she uncovered some of these case studies and what that means to you and how you can implement those in your organization. And then um, for those of you who are online and can see on the screen, you're welcome to jump in, ask questions on the Q&A section. I can feed those off to Jean as we're speaking. And um, yeah, it should be a, a really fun conversation. So Jean, welcome. Hi, so nice to talk to you and to be with everybody. I am going to uh, share my screen in a minute. Um, hopefully you'll see that. Yep, we can see that. You can see my screen. Absolutely. So um, thank you so much. Um, and you know, what's interesting is when I wanted, when I, when I did this book, you know, it's my fourth book and a continuation of the whole goal of my work, which is to help all of you out in the marketplace, having been somebody leading this work for so many years, it was important to give you a simplified guide and an action book that everyone in the organization could find themselves in. Um, connect ourselves with the life of customers using this metaphor of your mom, right? Because we're, you know, our work, while we're focusing on customers, we get caught up in the work of the business. We get caught up in the silos. We get caught up in the transactions. We get caught up in the execution of tasks. And so this question, would you do that to your mother? While it's, you know, kind of funny, 
also should make us pause. You know, at the front line, Christine, it, even if you can't change a policy, you can modulate the way you deliver bad news or mm -hmm. how you start the conversation. In the middle of the organization, um, where people are redefining or building those processes and those rules and those conditions and the policies and the contracts, we should pause <laughs> to say, would we really do this to somebody we care about? And then clearly from a leadership standpoint, this is choosing how you'll earn revenue. Do you really want to, you know, hide, hide surprises in your contract terms or your fine print or nickel and dime customers as a way to get fast revenue, but lose long-term valuable customers. And so um, that's really the way that I, um, I built the book and also wanted to have some fun with it. Um, it. Can you see the 32 toolkits in the front of that screen, Christine? You know what, um, Jean, I can see kind of half of it. I can see the section that says comic and introductory story. So the part A, you know, I can see 32 toolkits, but not the full screen. Oh. I wonder what's happening there. Yeah, I don't know. Let me let's see here. Yeah, let's, okay. Yeah, I can see the slide here, but I don't know if it's just a formatting issue. I don't know. Yeah, it's off to its center. It's off to the right. Yeah, a few people have chimed in and said that they can see that um, off to the right as well. Yeah, it's oh, went, that way. Well, um, so I'm sorry about that. I uh, What we'll do is let me walk you through. Um, I don't know why. Um, well, I wonder if you just do it in your regular format instead of the slide view. Maybe that'll work out okay. How do I do that? Uh, let's see. Are you, oh, you maybe are, are you on an Apple computer? Because you're speaking up to a PC person over here. I'm on here. an Apple computer. Here, let's see. <laughs> let's see. How is this now? No, still the same. So the view you just had prior to that, you can work in there. And I think everyone will be able to see everything okay. This one or a different one? Uh, the other, the previous view where you can just click on the various slides. Yeah, like that. Oh, oh like if that, that works for oh, you. Okay. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, so what I'm going to do is this. Okay. Thanks, everybody. It's always about the technology. Okay, and then we have Sandia that says just click on each slide. So I don't, I guess, I don't know what that, if that like works. That. Is that good? Yep, that's perfect. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Yes, yeah, so and thank you. John says it's perfect and Sonia perfect, says that's and it. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> yes, thanks, everybody. Really appreciate your, your, your info. I'm an author and sometimes. So here's the deal. I wanted to make this fun, accessible, and something you could hand um, as easily to your CEO to say, here's what we need to become um, to the middle of the organization. And, and also for all of you with teams and the front line, it's, it's the story of our life as customers. Um, and I also wanted to make it actionable. So there's almost 85, company, 85 companies um, that are talked about, but 32, 32 case studies which form a toolkit. So the beginning of each start, story starts with a comic. I hired a cartoonist and, you know, a cartoon in one visual look uh, kind of unites us around our life as a customer shorthands us and can provide us as both a salve and a, a, a little bit of a nudge, as my Italian grandma would say, to say, okay, are we still doing this? Let's get on with it. Um, so you've got an intro, then a case study for each one. This happens to be about Sweetgreen, um, who's honoring customers' time. And then to write to the right of every case study, a mom lens where you can reflect on what you're doing so that you can determine how to take action moving forward. Um, and then the, then, then the last chapter is called Stop the Shenanigans, and at the end, <laughs> I get to use all these fun momisms. Um, and then that is actually 32 summary questions with very specific action items that you can evaluate and start driving your action plan from, along with, Christine, hope you love this, a Make Mom proud o meter <laughs> <laughs> to just take a quick and fun kind of assessment um, of where you are today. Oh dear, we've got the cover mom on the left and so proud we found the happy version of the mom on the right. And you know, I don't know, what's your feeling about this? Does anybody, do you guys like this approach? I mean, I've already started reading the book. I don't know if anybody else has it yet, but what I can tell you is it's 
and for those of you who don't have it, it's a very easy read, but what's so great about it is everything's so practical and able, you're able to implement it and really think about things in, in small chunks. Some books are just like a lot of content really fast without understanding how to action it. And what I love is just the layout and then it's very simple. Here's, here's what we're talking about. Here's a case study that's living and breathing that. And here's how that relates back to this make mom proud moment and kind of tying everything together. So for that's me, right. I just think it's really great. And I love, Jean was talking about earlier, the idea of like maybe starting a book club, whether it's, you know, we do that here at CSIA with all of you and we can do a book club and work through this together, or you do it internally with your team and other um, departments. I think that every department, not just those of you running customer experience and customer service can benefit from that. Oh, I get, love the mama meter is popping up here. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and so, you know, it's funny because yes, this work is serious, but we need to make it consumable and, um, and, and work that, you know, we can giggle and laugh at every once in a while. And so to that end, let me walk you through the, the names of the chapters. Um, and, and the first, so the first, the, there's an introduction, of course, that just kind of level sets on why we're going to do this work. And the important thing about this as we all know, this is not kumbaya, we are the world. This is about behaving differently in our business so that we earn the most, um, the, the, the most elevated kind of growth, the, mo the, most, the growth that comes from you know, acting at work like we were taught at home, but most importantly, honoring humans at the end of our decisions, honoring our employees and um, delivering on our values and what we know in the marketplace is that these are the companies that people are gravitating to. The millennials we know are making decisions about where they work and who they work for. There's been a lot written about that, but, but I would say all of us want to engage with companies and people who, who, who treat, who do the right thing and as a result, make more money than others do. Um, wouldn't you agree with that, Christine? I absolutely would. I think everyone, not even just the millennials, are reviewing like what's important anymore. I think that, you know, not to take a heavy turn on it, but like things have gotten so crazy and the work-life balance thing is a little more serious than it used to be. I think everyone's taking their personal wellness and the person that they are into account when they're doing everything. And I think the values of your organization, how you're, you feel when you're doing the work that you do is, has a huge impact. And, you know, knowing now, believe it or not, that there are more jobs available now than there are unemployed people, you, they kind of are in the right to be picky, I think. That's right. So this first chapter, be the person I raise you to be is so, so important. And, and, and I call it, you know, enabling people to bring the best version of themselves to work, um, you know, enabling congruence of heart, what we, what we know is right and habit, what we're encouraged, able and rewarded and celebrated for in business. And so um, the notion of this is certainly hiring the right people, uh, but getting rid of the rules as much as you can, giving them customer values so they can move from being a policy cop to a rescue artist to really being a you know, really critical part of the organization, allowing them to be memory makers. I can show you um, a few of the slides here. That's that first intro slide. Um, so here's a comic. This is about, are you, this is the first story in the book about are you creating a, a company of people who show up as caring? Um, this story happens to be, for example, about um, the case study is on Cleveland Clinic, but the notion is in every single one of our businesses, we're built based on silos and the silos are great, but sometimes we build, we build processes for their efficiency that cut the human inadvertently out of, out of the, out of the, the scenario, you know, so in this, in this scenario, I, I, it, throughout the book, Christine, if you started reading it, you know, I'm asking the mom question, would you roll your mom into a hallway and just leave her there? Well, <laughs> of course you wouldn't, but in, in, in the scenario of healthcare and think about your own, you know, one really wonderful person takes your mom out of her room and rolls her to a hallway to where her test is going to be. The tech comes and takes her out of the hallway, does her test and puts her back in the hallway where she waits. And our customer gets caught kind of in the Bermuda Triangle of these processes that are built for their efficiency and these silos who don't necessarily connect so we don't show up as caring to the customer. 
Yeah, and you know what, Jean, I, I just have to say, because you did start the book with this story, and what really resonated with me is, you know, you, all of us have it, at one time or another either experienced this personally with ourselves or a member in the family, or they, you've seen it when you're at a yeah. hospital where there's somebody sitting in the hallway, and it really kind of hits that personal chord where you're like, yeah, it's not just there's another person sitting in the hallway if you put that lens on of thinking about it as a mom or a family member. But when you think of your policies in that regard, it changes that. And I've yes. seen that too with some of the companies I work with. And I know you'll talk a little bit more about that, where they really did the right thing by the customer, not necessarily for the company bottom line, but whenever you do the right thing by the customer, you are actually helping the company's bottom line. It might not be in that specific interaction, but overarchingly, it's going to affect the company in a very positive way. That, that's right. And, you know, the case study in this is especially compelling. And the, the whole point of the setup that I gave you all in the beginning, this setup is, while I may be talking about a certain company in the case study and the intro, you can then reflect on your own behavior and say, what are we doing? How close or far are we to that behavior? So you can start taking action. And as you said, Christine, in these bite-sized pieces, you know, we, part of why this work implodes is we try to do too much. We're boiling the ocean. Um, this story in, in the book is about Cleveland Clinic. And I, I'm just, I'm such an admirer of them and Adrian Boise, who is the chief patient experience officer over there and the work they're doing. But uh, this was actually kicked off by their CEO, um, Dr. Toby McGuire. Uh, and he said that it, this was back in, gosh, I, a while ago, but he said when they started this work, patients come to us for high quality care. And again, like most of our businesses, we're good at what we do technically and we're efficient, but the, the humanness doesn't wire in. And for a variety of reasons, I'm going to walk you through some of their actions. They are now um, the number two hospital in the U.S. based on U.S. News and World Report, and their recommendation rating is in the 90th percentile of all hospitals. Um, and, and what they did was these three actions to begin, which they've moved very, very, continued to do work on, but I love these three actions in the beginning. Number one, and Christine, you probably read this because you're into the book already, they created a simple rule initially, and rules are good initially these positive rules um, because they, they create clarity. If you say to everybody, go care for customers, it's like, well, I already do. I'm a caring person. Well, this rule put a fine point on it and made it operational. And their initial rule was they called it the no passing rule, which meant anybody in a hospital hallway, if they see a patient's call light on, whether you're a janitor, a tech, certainly a doctor, a nurse, somebody going in to deliver flowers, if that call light is on, you go into that room and care for the human in that bed. Make sure someone knows they know that call light is on. So I love that because it was black and white, something everybody needed to do. So I'd encourage all of you in your business, if you need a starting point, figure out what's your version of the no passing zone. Um, the next thing they did, I, I love because what they, what they did in this progression is address Many of the, the issues, I call them the underbelly issues, Christine, that get in the way of making this work stick. So the second thing they did was elevate everyone's roles. You know, we get cast into technicians or technical or tactical roles. You're a call center rep or you're on the floor or you're a salesperson. Well, they changed everybody's title to caregiver. Um, and, and in the past, only doctors got to have that role. So what did, what did you think of that story, Christine? Yeah, I love it. And I, you know what, I think it kind of resonates a little bit with at Disney, right? Because the, the expectation there is that you don't walk by a piece of trash, no matter who you are, right? You spend down, you pick it up. So it's the same thing with the no pass zone, right? And then they call their team members, their cast members, and, and then they're at, uh, in the hospital caregivers. And I think it, it is important because when you, you're not identified by your title necessarily, but when you're called a caregiver, it's different than being called like head of records or something, right? right? Like, well, yeah. Just and approach when, it differently. And when you elevate people's roles, guess what? They rise. Um, mm -hmm. There's some wonderful information in the book talking about how more than even a 20% increase in raise, what we want is to be honored and recognized for our intuitiveness, 
our, our ability to make a difference and having a seat at the table. Um, and so I think what this also does, as you mentioned with the Disney thing, is it gives people permission, right? Mm -hmm. So no longer are you just, you know, cleaning out a sink. If, if someone is, looks like their pillows need fluff, take the time, fluff their pillow. You know, you are a caregiver and it changes our demeanor. It, it raises yeah. us up. We were doing work um, with a spa company and, and we changed, you know, what we decided that the, the work there was really to create escape. And so we changed who we hire, how we develop people to be customer escape artists, right? I love that. That's so great. what's your version of, of, of how you raise people up? And also then what's wonderful about this is that this, this then connects right back into how you hire and who you hire. And, and then the last thing they did, um, which is important is they connected the silos in a deliberate way. When you're in the hospital, and again, going back to this example, um, you're in a bed, in a room, and people round. So you're going to have every, if you've got five doctors or three doctors or two, they visit you separately. The technicians visit you separately. The nurses, and you keep saying the same thing over and over again to people. Um, what they do now is they round, they call it managing the 360. They round as a team and they take care of the whole human uh, and the whole family. So you're not, you don't have what the Mayo Clinic calls it the burden of care. So what are you doing in your organization uh, to connect that burden of care, to connect um, and deliver that 360? And are you uniting everyone to care regardless of role? Yeah, I love, I do enjoy that story. And another, um, Somebody else popped up and said something about, you know, Ritz Carlton with the ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. So it's, you can definitely make it so it fits with your company, right? Because I think right. some people are like, hey, this case study, that's about hospitals. I can't make that work. But, you know, there's lots of examples that you just gave with the spa and the Ritz and Disney that you can definitely see what your no pass zone or what what title might work best where That's everyone's exactly really right. Involved. Well, and, and in this section, after the comic section here, in this buildup, while I'm focusing on one case study, in many cases, I'm talking about five or six or seven other companies and examples mm -hmm. so that by the time we get to the case study, you have context and the ability to think about your business. And then certainly, um, well, never mind. Sorry about that get rid of that. Um, certainly the ability to um, think about, you know, these questions here in the Make Mom proud -o meter the Stop the Shenanigans, really gets into, you, you can deep dive, deep dive into your operation. So you get this for inspiration, but then get into your organization. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead, Christine. Hey, real quick, Jean, I just, there was a question that I don't know if these slides, are these something that you're able to share at the end or are these stuff, something that you're just kind of using to support the content right now? Um, well, this is my keynote. I can okay. put a package together a, a few of them as a PDF. Um, they're okay. all in most of that. They're all of these comics are in the book. Mm -hmm. um, as you and I mentioned earlier, Christine, I'm also building an e-course Yes. And then, and then when I build out the resources, there's so many resources in the book. I'm going to also be offering um, bundles of some things. If you don't mind signing up to, you know, you put your email in and I'll send you some bundles of things. So that'll, that'll take place over the next month or so, hopefully as I, as I get these bundles. Um, but, but for your team, I'll put some things together. I'll okay, put perfect. Together. Yeah. We can yeah. cover that at the end. I know you're offering some fun things now. If people wanted to buy multiple books and you yeah. can Definitely, so, definitely. Okay, we can talk about that at the end. Yeah, okay. I'm happy. I'm a giver. You know, I'm the Italian giver. So, and you know, you know, I I don't sell. I give. And then my 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 goal is, if I've given you value, then you'll reach back out, and I can help. You know, that's really how it works. Absolutely. I love this one. Uh, again, this isn't be the person I raised you to be, which is, are you are you high? And you like this comic, Christine? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you hiring? There's sometimes I would do it though. <laughs> I know, right? Um, and, and this is about hiring. So this, I love this story. This is Pal's Sudden Service. It's a hot dog and hamburger place. Um, they have 26 stores all, all over Tennessee. They've won a Malcolm Baldrige Quality Award 
Um, they've lost seven general managers in 33 years, only seven. They have one of the highest revenue per square foot of their category of business. Um, but what's really amazing that they do is they, and again, I put this in here because so many of us have, you know, either entry people or transient workforces and their turnover is so much lower because they put so much thought into hiring the human behind the resume. In particular, Pales puts, uh, does a 60-point psychometric survey where they ask things that get to know who the person is. For example, um, in general, I feel pretty good about myself. I, am, I trust people that I just meet or things like, um, I think it's important to raise my voice to get my point across. You know, there's not a lot of room in this hot dog and hamburger stand, so they want to build <laughs> co cohesive teams, but any team is about the cohesiveness. Um, more and more, our brands are the humanity and the humanness that we put forth in the marketplace, and that's got to come from the people that represent who we are. So hiring has got to be one of the most important things that we do and how we recruit. And so, as we mentioned before, there's lots of other stories in there about how different people are recruiting in the build up to this one. Hey, I have a question. I don't know. I don't know if you're going to get to this, but um, the the czar of bad policy or something. What was oh it? yes, that is. Um, um, so so that's going to come up here in uh, "Don't Make Me Feed You Soap." Yes. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that because I think this would that would really be um, speak to maybe some of those who are in companies that they know have poor policies or procedures. And additionally, like maybe they're not the ones who can change it, but their ability to influence is certainly there. And so if you can speak to that um, for being able to influence and then also like what this, you know, czar of bad policy from Hootsuite, what that they're really <laughs> looking for. Well, yeah, you know, what's interesting is that, and again, throughout this book, I'm <coughs> really made a real point of saying these things don't occur because people intentionally mean to make people's lives crazy. It's that mm -hmm. over time, things seep in. So it, the whole point of this chapter, don't make me feed you soap, is there's, there's a bunch of stuff that exists in all of our lives as customers that no matter what business, it continues to persist. You know, it's our phone trees or waiting on hold or our policies or our language and our jargon. And one of them in particular is how much we create conditions, you know, the ifs, ands, and buts, and then also the complexity of getting something done. I call it, you know, you're putting the monkey on the customer's back to get to, to do every time a customer asks you for something, you ask them for something in return or you create complexity. So um, Hootsuite, they, they, you know, they're a fast growing company if, for people who don't know them. They, they help with people with their social media posting. They've grown very, very rapidly. But they had put into place over time um, a process for giving away, uh, you know, essentially a $15 t-shirt required so many approvals and process steps and paperwork that it cost them $200 in processing paperwork and approvals to give away this $15 t-shirt. <laughs> and, and I think that happens in all of our organizations. We were trying so hard to manage our KPIs and keep things in check. Uh, that we got, we get the, we put the process behind, in front of the outcome. And so they created this thing called the czar of bad systems or it wasn't, it was that what we call, they called it the czar, what do you call it? Yeah, I think it's the czar of bad policies maybe. Yeah, something, the czar of getting rid of complexity. <laughs> yeah. And um, th this was about really taking that eye and looking at all of these things um, and bubbling them up and getting rid of the, the ones that just don't make sense. And so to your point, all of you, you can be a really important voice in identifying and bringing to the attention of whoever would be the one to help create this role. But what I urge you to do, which I've learned, you know, I learned this way back when at Land's End when I was training 2000 phone operators a million years ago, was to be taken seriously, we need a couple things. We need enough data to prove that it's a, a thing and an issue and enough proof that it's happening over and over again. And also 
experiential feedback. So whether it's a video or audio or the screenshots, make sure that you package it so that your message and you can be taken seriously and, and therefore also so that you can be a thought leader and start to influence this. And, and even to your point, Christine, identify that maybe this is something that uh, potentially should be formalized in the organization. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and so, it, so it's just a matter of really just take, asking people to take note of it and, and figuring out how serious an issue it is so that they can present that back to somebody who might be able to influence that. Well, yeah, the last thing you want to do, and I know nobody does this, but I, I did it when I was young. And I, I, you know, it was like five people have called on this. Well, guess what? They're not going to get that, like start waving flags on five people. You have to show two things, a volume and, and, and um, enough things pointing at the same problem so that they've got convergence of lots of data sources pointing at the same thing and enough volume that people will take it seriously. And, and that's when also um, I think that you, you really move and can, can have that strong voice in the company that you deserve to have, that you should have, because you're sitting on this gold mine of data and content. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just from your personal experience in the various organizations you've worked with, Jean, tell me about like how you've noticed a difference in you know, not just how much customer experience has improved, but the, the actual revenue that's generated by organizations who do take this kind of thing more seriously than those who just kind of are reactionary and, inner, and transactional. Well, yeah, let's start with the negative. Um, you know, this research has been circulating for a while, um, but, you know, Siegel and Gale has said that companies are leaving $86 billion on the table um, when they're creating complexity wow. in what they do. Mm-hmm. And um, what we also know is organizations that are starting with customers' emotions, that are um, really driving the business from customer needs and customer experience achieve this kind of results. Three times customers that are three times more likely to recommend them and they can achieve an increase of, you know, up to 85% in sales because what the customer is recognizing is you're starting with their life. Mm -hmm. You're starting with their goal. Um, You know, I, I do a lot of work with people on their journey map and other things. And typically you'll read their journey map and it's their sales funnel or their goals are what they want to get out of customers versus what they want to give, deliver to customers to help them achieve their goals. And, and I think that's where the switch is occurring and where we're, we're able to help companies achieve this kind of outcome is, is by, uh, by redesigning. And, and that's really what I, what I address in this third major chapter of the book called Put Others Before Yourself, which is, you know, the paradoxical thing has to kick in, which is, in order to achieve your goals, you need to first help customers achieve theirs. Um, you know, sometimes we have this kind of thing sitting on as our purpose, right? I thought this was a good one. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's about, you know, that's about right, though. I always say that sometimes the organizations that talk mostly about, like, how great they are at, like, customer experience or customer service, like, they're saying it because they're not actually doing it. And they're trying to convince people that they're good at it. Well, right. And, and so, you know, the companies that are really um, moving forward do a number of things. And that's why the book is laid out the way that they do. They honor the, cust- the employee at, their, at the end of their decision. Um, they, they make sure that they, they get rid of the, the soapy moments, the things that really um, so they honor the person at the end of their decision. They get rid of the moments that are common in all of our lives as customers. You know, one of the questions in there, and, and again, this isn't to in any way make anybody feel uncomfortable, but would you want your mom to go through your phone tree, for example? Um, they, they redesign their operation from their customer's life. Um, and then importantly, they also build their operation and, and build their what they do from, from, from taking the high road. You know, I, there's a wonderful story in here around trust in this last big chapter. Um, and we've all experienced this too, right, Christine? You go into the bank and why do they, why are they, why is the pen chained to the, <laughs> the They've got your money and they're locking up their pen. Yeah, right? 
right? Makes sense. Um, and, and so one of, in this last chapter, I encouraged people to do, and this, you're, you all have such a powerful impact in all of these because you can be the voice. And I think this book is powerful for you because it gives you a framework to almost organize and, and deliver back what you're hearing. Um, trust is critical. And one of the things I encourage people to do is do a trust audit. Uh, you know, think about your journey um, in, in, the, in your policies, in your interactions, in your paperwork, certainly. Is there anything that you're doing that says to the customer, we're building this to protect ourselves from you? Well, and Jean, just with, when you said trust, uh, it makes me think too, it's not just about trusting the customer or honoring them. Like, talk a little bit about like where there's a, there's a big disconnect for organizations who aren't trusting or honoring their team members. Cause that's, that's like- exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, I don't have that comic here, um, but in the book there's, um, you have the power to improve lives. <laughs> It's my subliminal message all the way through it. There's a wonderful case study in the beginning of this chapter. Um, uh, the, the Be the person I raised you be, to be. The comic is, would you turn down your mom's warranty claim three days out of warranty? Mm -hmm. Well, to your point, Christine, we force people into doing that because we've got rules. And in large part, we're not trusting the front line to make an in the moment judgment call that's probably going to be more relevant in, in some cases than that blanket rule that was created for, for just a blank, to be a blanket rule to protect us from the customer. But what if we, and, and what I talk about is let policy and the golden rule collide. This is not about giving away the store willy nilly, but trusting your frontline with customer lifetime value training them on how to assess and, and, and read a customer and what their situation is, um, enabling them to then make the call because they've got a very, very high value customer in front of them or someone whose livelihood depends on it, you know, and then honor and celebrate that. Don't, don't after the fact, you know, make it be punitive in any way. So it's, it's, this whole thing has got to be about enabling and trusting to your point, the front line, as well as, so this first chapter is about trusting the front line, really mm -hmm. powerful and important. And then that's got to translate then to the customer as well in what, do your policies themselves trust the customer. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's, it's both sides of it. It's got to be covered. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, I mean, if anybody wants to chime in either with a question or in the chat about just a kind of any, if you're having any difficulties or you're agreeing with this or there's a struggle within your organization that you're interested in sharing or we can talk about, you know, please go ahead and type something in so because we can we can cover that. And I do oh, want to- Here's that comic, by the way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there. And I'm, yeah, and that's definitely- happened and I think that it's interesting this is something I always struggle with when I go into companies when you see that they're not trusting of their team members to make these decisions again we go back to the Ritz Carlton their team members have up to two thousand dollars to spend on making something right that's in the book that is in the book. Yep. and they never you know and they never go that to that extent they use their mind to figure out okay this is what can work in this moment but it's because they can react in that moment versus having to run it up the flagpole that's right that can do that and i think that if we're paying if we have hired someone we've gone through the interview process with them we're paying them money if we can't trust them to make like decisions as a human should make a decision to another human i think maybe our hiring practice is flawed as well well and and i agree and it, it's also about deliberateness so for example you know and this is where also all of you should be able to have a seat at this table, which is I guarantee you that you can put your heads together. You already know the, I call these the moments of vulnerability when your customer is going to need this extra wiggle room and where, you know, you can identify, is it warranty about to go expire or something about your policy or, you know, you know already the moments of vulnerability and the companies that are, elevated and stand head and tails above others are deliberate in giving their employees 
uh, the ability to make decisions in this case study I love, this is what Alaska Airlines does. It's called the We Trust You Toolkit. And so what they've got is everybody, baggage handlers, those people checking you in, people at the gates, and, and they've created a bumped up version of this for the folks on the phones and on chat, et cetera, and service, where they have proactively identified multiple options that people at their discretion and at being trusted, whether it's giving you miles, that extra glass of champagne because you're having your anniversary, um, booking you on another flight without a fee change, whatever it is, they've identified proactively, and this is where you can have a voice, what are those moments where these toolkits should go into place? You know, those, you know, we can't make this up moments where Murphy's Law kicks in and bad stuff happens to customers just because it does or because they didn't plan ahead or whatever. You know, if you come up with the top five to 10 and then the gestures uh, ahead of time that people have at their disposal, it changes things. What do you think of that, Christine? Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree. I 100% agree with that. We actually have a question and a comment. We have a comment that just says, um, you know, our processes often cause us to put more resources in how to say no yes. rather than just saying yes. And it's all about mitigating risk. So in, the, in that sense, where, there, where organizations are working around like, okay, well, we're, we're trying to cover our behinds, for lack of a better term. Right how do they navigate those waters so that it isn't about putting the resources into saying no or making a $15 t-shirt giveaway a $200 process? Like how do you streamline that and still make sure that you're risk averse? Well, you know, if that's insurance or financial services or whatever, I understand. Um, but if you know how much those no's are costing you, that's your power. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the very first ways that we get traction, you know, kind of like that no passing rule is also about helping to identify where our processes and our practices are actually costing us more in either, in either the human element to process it. And, and then most especially in the customers who have left because of it. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, I've, I, I have customers who have lost clients who have lost multi-million dollar customers over a change, a change fee, right? You know, right. you're our B2B customer and you've spent 10 million or however many millions, and yet we're going to charge you $200 for a change fee. Really? Like, wh what is the point of that? Um, especially because the front line knows that that, that, that stuff occurs. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the other thing that it is, you know, is, so my point is, if you know the information, it, here's the other thing, connect with your C, your, your um, CFO right? Yeah. Become a partner with them in identifying this data and these proof points about the cost of these things. One of the very yeah. first things I did when I got to Allstate was I became uh, thick partners with both the CFO and the guy running sales because they were in my books. I talk about something called the, the power core. Sorry about this little thing. Um, talk about something called the power core. And we, by connecting with the CFO, and connecting the dots between these actions and ringing the money bell of the organization, I was able to get traction. So and, you have yeah. that power. You do have that power because you have that information, but bring these people aboard as your partner in this. Let, let it be their mantra that they take up. And, and then you will be a part of that. In, in yeah, and sometimes even it's just a simple calculation. I mean, you can get into the weeds with it, but even just going, okay, what's the cost of bad service? Let's outline like the top five visible costs that there we- There you go. There you go. Keep it simple. That's yeah. right. You know, okay. and, and you know, what about this doozy? Let's see. This is the nickeling and diming. Are you there? I am. I'm sorry. I'm always impressed when um, I get to a hotel that's not charging for right. Water, right. Or they give it to you at the front desk and it's nice and cold and you've just been traveling and that makes so much of an impact on me than when I'm dying of thirst and then there's like the water glasses are questionable and then there's a right. the water bottle that's well, like. So what's your version of nickel dime? You're hearing mm -hmm. it from your customers firsthand. You know, start recording those calls. You, you guys have the power of the human voice talking about this stuff. Record it, 
record a bunches of it and then play it back. Mm -hmm. What we know is when we get the voice of the human in the ear of the leaders, it changes things much more than a dashboard or a calculation does sometimes combine it with that, but lead with the human story, lead with the voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and here's another question um, that we have here, Gina. It says, where are you finding the organizational roles that have the cachet to implement policy across the front door customer interface and the back door service delivery? So what titles or reporting structures are there versus, it says, quote, unquote, the old guard? Yeah. Well, so I've written two books uh, about the role of the chief customer officer, the customer experience officer. My latest one is called Chief Customer Officer 2.0. And, and that is the role that's, that's emerging in many organizations. And it's really, to, to your point, whoever asked that question, and thank you for that. It was John. Uh, hi, John. Um, a way to unite all the silos and to be proactive and make it about experience, not just reacting, right? Um, so if you'd like to know, and I'll, what I'll do, Christine, is give you the first chapter of that book as well for folks to access. Oh, that'd be and, wonderful. Thank you. And, 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 and by the way, everybody, that's a career path. That's a very mm -hmm. deliberate career path you can consider. You know, my first job was training the phone operators at Land's End. And, and then from there, because I kept asking the CEO question, 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 I eventually became their first version of a customer experience officer. You know, when we went public, I reported to the executive committee by the time I was, you know, 26. And by the time we went public, I presented the connection between customer experience and uh, profitability and, and, and then went on and led it in lots of other companies. So if you're interested in doing that kind of work, um, definitely think about it. I, I actually also, and I'm not this, I only do everything I do to help. I have a podcast every week called the Chief Customer Officer Human Duct Tape Show. Um, and I'm interviewing people in these roles. So you might wanna listen to them. We've had over a hundred of these now, very, very enjoyable, uh, every kind of business vertical um, in there. And many people who started running uh, as call center leaders or service leaders who have gone onto these roles as well. Well, I think the thing that's so great is it not only is it a role that can promote you in, you know, your career path, but it's also something where you're actually making a big, a large difference. I think sometimes when we're delivering customer service and we are like really locked down by some of these policies and procedures, instead of, you know, having to just deal with it, by taking the bull by the horns and kind of like illuminating some of these issues to those who might be able to help. That's it, right. It allows you to feel like you're really moving the dial in your role, but also helping people in that process. And, and that's what I yearned for um, when I was doing that work initially was to have a bigger impact, to have, to feel like I was proactively helping the organization get from point A to point B, because in our roles, what we're often doing is fixing the customer. And that is noble and critical and important, but there's a critical role to fix the company because all of many of the reasons why people are contacting you should be able to be eliminated or reduced if we just fix the systemic reason why they were contacting you in the first place. That's right. Um, yeah. and, and so that's often the first piece of the work, but then we go on um, beyond that to also understand emotions and uh, what people really value and then take the company to, a, to another level to, and, and the, the, those are the companies that really stand out the most in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, I thought you might like this, uh, not that one. Hold on. Sorry. Hey, Jean, where would uh, our listeners find those podcasts that you're referring to? Where can they go? Um, let me just do this for you right now. Oh yeah, sure. Oops. So my website is customerbliss.com. I married a guy named Bliss. Um, and, and here's the podcast. That worked out. I love that. Yeah, right. I, had, I, I make a joke. I went all over match.com. <laughs> um, and if you want to get the first chapter of any of my books, they're right here. You just go download the first chapters. Okay, so we still have the Virgin Hotel slide up, but yeah, if you go to her, the Customer Bliss site, um, and I can share that in an email out to you guys once we get our slide deck as well. I oh, think here we go. Is switching it, through now. You see it now? It's, for me, no, but others okay. might be able to see it. It looks okay. like it's kind of transitioning from one oh, screen to another. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're oh, sorry. That's okay. But anyway, 
Um, yes, customer, we'll give you all of the details so you guys can access that very, um, very easily. Um, I want to, I want to perhaps end with this one, um, which is the four seasons. And I love this because it, it, it talks a lot about what we discussed, Christine, and every chapter includes the front line because, and, and this is where I think it's important for all of you. You have a voice, you have a, the power to impact every part of um, the organization. And what the four seasons does is after every, um, after every shift, they huddle and they do what's called the glitch report. And they focus on the why something happened, not the who created it. So mm -hmm. at the, every, you know, a customer's unhappy with their sheets or, you know, hundreds of the reasons. And, but what's important is everything we talked about, Christine, then manifests itself there. It's then figuring out the why, how do they then give the power and the gratitude and the dignity to the front line to go fix it? Exactly. Yeah. And I think, and I love that idea of just like trying to come together to figure out what the problem is versus trying to pinpoint a person that might have caused That's the problem because right. it doesn't actually, <clears throat> if, even if that were the case, it's more about them than they weren't trained properly or they need coaching or something. Or it's your people are bad. And by the way, so much of what rolls to your feet, as you all know, was caused in other parts of the organization. And, and you're doing those workarounds and what might sometimes feel like a body slam to yeah. make the customer feel whole. Um, and, and that's why I think that this is another opportunity you have. Don't just do the glitch uh, huddles with your department. Bring in the other, make it be something that you create that the organization participates in. This is when you start having that bigger role. Absolutely. All right, so should I just, I'm gonna throw it out because we've got about five minutes left. So I wanted to throw it out to anybody. If you have any questions or you have a comment, you can go and chat for comments. You can go to the Q&A section if you wanna ask a question or just you know, put it out there and we're happy to chat about it. But in conclusion, as they're writing their questions, Jean, is there anything you wanna leave us with and, and some thoughts uh, as far as what we can take back to the workplace or even if we want to um, look at using, utilizing this book, what you think the, the best approach, approach is? Sure, you bet. Well, you know, I, I, the way I wrote this book was that it became a tool for you to use not only inside your team, but as a collaborative tool. So. If you, if, you, if you want to improve your team, one of the things that you might consider doing is going to the back. The last chapter is called Stop the Shenanigans, the last major sh chapter, and that's where the mommo meters are. Mm. Um, you can go through each of the four main chapters have, have these questions here um, like this. There's 32 of them. And figure out which ones, A, are most important for you and do your ranking. Um, so you can do that inside your team but again, if you want to create this expanded movement inside of your organization, you might use this Make Mom proud -o meter um, assessment with your leaders, you know, facilitate that or find the ones you think are most important to bring people together. And what I'll also do, Christine, is I'll give this to you all as a PDF that you can, that you can use to share as well as that, that first chapter. Oh, perfect. Uh, and, and again, this is so consumable for you to, to really move forward with it. Um, here's, the, here's another thing that you might enjoy. Because this work is as much about taking action as sharing it and celebrating it, we've created a website called makemomproud.com. It's um, right here with the dashes between. I couldn't get it without the dashes. But um, as you can see, you can upload a picture of your mom um, then fill in the story of how she inspires you and something you've done in your business to make her proud. And I am sure there are things either you do or all of your people do. Let them celebrate. I'll open this up to all of them. And, and then you can, you can post these and grab these and celebrate these um, with them. So what we wanted to do was create hope and energy around this for all of you. What a fun idea. I'm getting very cool. Like, and I agree. I think that is a really fun idea because I, I think there's just a lot of people who would love to celebrate not only what they do, but their mothers. 
Uh, oh, I've got John with a comment again. It's saying, totally appreciate the concept of mom looking over my shoulder. This appears to be as timeless and ubiquitous as the golden rule and everything I needed to know, I think I learned in kindergarten. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I just, I feel like this is, it's funny because it's, it seems so simple, but it's just not always that simple. And I think the nice thing about the way you've pieced everything together is you're right. It's, it's structured in a way that it's digestible and you can tackle it. You, you have all these ideas swimming in your mind and you know what should be done or how it could be done better, but you're not necessarily sure, necessarily sure of the steps to take to get there. And I think that's what I really appreciate about this. It's not like hard reading where I'm trying to figure out how to extract all the components. Like it's really outlined for me and extracted on how I can make it user friendly. And that's what I think is really fun. And the case studies, <laughs> those are just so good. Well, and what I, what I tell people is, you know, I've been, it's taken me 35 years of experience to be able to write this book this way, because mm -hmm. you need to know the complexity of it to then break it down and make it consumable. Um, so thank you for that. It, 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 there was so much thought put into this, uh, to make this something you can pick up, be inspired by, get hope from and take action and use in whatever way. And you guys, you do, you have the power to improve lives from where you sit. You have the power to reach those leaders. And also, you know, sometimes find someone who gets it and start there. That's, that's what I've done in some of these really big sticky companies. Yeah, that's a good idea. Because there's somebody out there who could understand what you're you're thinking or seeing, and it might not be at the very top right away. But it's all about kind of putting the the branches out there, I guess. Well, and the other thing we're finding is leaders want a legacy. This mm -hmm. is a legacy. This is about mm -hmm. growing with your values, about being a different growth through an elevated approach to growth. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jean, well, this was wonderful. I, I think just from the comments, I'm saying that everyone agrees with me. This was just definitely an hour well spent. Um, and for everybody listening and who's still on, we'll make sure that we, we package some things together and get that out to you. Great. Um, so, and that may take a little bit of time. So if you don't see it today, you know, don't, don't panic, but we'll get it out to you along with um, chapter one of this book. And we'll also include the website customerbliss.com so that you can understand where to find the podcast and find the other chapters of um, some of the, the other books that the Jean has. Yeah. That are well, all and I books. hope you'll go out and buy this book. I mean, I spent two and a half years writing it and it would just be a joy to get it in your hands because I, I really think that it's going to be a, a nice tool and very helpful for you. So that would, I would love that. So thank you. 100% agree. Yeah. And they can get it where, where can they get it? Where books are sold. It's on Amazon. It's, you know, it's everywhere now. Definitely. You just yeah. uh, do a search for it on Amazon. It'll pop right up or Barnes and Noble, any of your booksellers it's there. And it's also, I also read the audible version of it. So if you prefer audible, I read it. Oh, well, I always like it when the author reads it because you know what parts I really like. Yeah. So it's Kindle, it's Audible, it's hardcover. And then we'll also give information about the e-course coming up. I did 35 videos, so I bring it to life. Beautiful. All right, Jean, yeah, keep us posted on that. Okay. And, um, thank you so much for your thank time, you. everyone. Thank you so much for participating and for being on with us today. All right. Take care, Jean. Thank you thank all. You.